Thanks, Stephen. Um, I do want to get on to our uh, main presentation of the uh, evening. So our main presentation is uh, going to be by Sarah Atkinson. So Sarah Atkinson is um, an awesome person all around, but is also a uh, graduate of the Nova Scotia Community College Heritage Carpentry Program in uh, Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. She's also a graduate of high school too. <laughs> And uh, we're really happy to have uh, to have her here today, and also our second grad of Nova Scotia Community College presenting in just the last um, three months. And so Sarah has been working uh, in the field of heritage carpentry for is it two years or is it three now? <clears throat> I did a two year program, and I've been working full time for a year now. For just one year? Oh my gosh! It seems like it's been longer. <laughs> Yeah, I've been following your projects uh, on Instagram there and really impressed, really intrigued by some of the work that you're doing because it's not a terribly like popular program of practice as far as I understand. So really exciting um, to see uh, uh, what you have to uh, share with us today. I understand you have three projects that you wanted to show us. Um, well, it's, it's going to focus mainly on one, the same principles of restoring windows sort of apply um, mm -hmm. to every project with variables, of course. Um, but to just sort of keep it concise, I've sort of focused on one project with examples from others, if that's okay. Awesome. Um, one of our uh, current members and actually our past uh, chair is actually uh, has a lot to do with Nova Scotia Community College. So that's Stephen Parsons. You've heard him ask a couple of questions. Come I did. I, I uh, was listening in and I had heard, Stephen, you're with NSCC and I was actually wondering in what capacity. Yeah, so I, uh, thanks, Sarah. Really nice to see you here. I, I'm a curriculum consultant for um, for the trades and technology, as well as the trades, or sorry, technology and environment, as well as the trades and transportation. Back in your day, it would have just been trades and technology as, in terms of the school, but I'm the consultant for, for that area. And I'm specifically responsible for all of the building and manufacturing programs. So that includes the carpentry and the heritage carpentry program so the program you would have graduated from is my is my baby so uh, great to see you here thank you so much for joining us thanks for having me he also wants everyone to know that he's just doing that for another seven days so that's the current countdown okay i guess congratulations or i, I don't know <laughs> i think you've been looking forward to it but yes Take it away, Sarah. We're happy to have you here. Okay, today. so I guess I just, I've prepared like a PowerPoint and I'm assuming I can s share my screen yeah, uh, without, without too much technical difficulty. Yeah, you've got it. Let's see here. Okay, and then we're going to... Let's see. Okay, we've got it, Sarah, thank you. We have Ooh. something? Yeah. Yep. Great. Yeah, okay, I'm seeing it as well. So here we go. So just a brief introduction, as Brad said, I'm uh, Sarah Atkinson. I grew up in Coal Harbor actually with, with Brad. Um, we went to the same high school and everything. Uh, carpentry is not my first career. It's not my second, <laughs> second career either, uh, but maybe it'll be my last. Um, <laughs> I did. I completed the two-year heritage car carpentry program uh, last April. I did a brief work term um, two summers ago, which would have been in between my first and second year, um, but it wasn't in the heritage field, uh, which is something that I was really interested in. So uh, after graduating, I've been employed with Edwards and Quarry Restoration and Custom Builders, um, with projects focused mainly down here on the South Shore. Um, and I've actually recently started taking on some projects of my own, garnering interest from, you know, in window restoration from, uh, you know, my social media accounts, like, like Brad mentioned there. And uh, it, really with restoration projects and windows uh, in particular, it, it takes a woodworking and a homeowning enthusiast or, you know, restorationist to share like a true appreciation for their traditional wooden window. It's, you know, it's an air, area of carpentry not many people delve into. Uh, and like, likewise, it's not the most common route that homeowners take when they're renovating or restoring. Um, some of our 
registered heritage property bylaws, especially in the Halifax area, I understand are a lot more strict uh, than they are here. Um, so you're actually required to restore your wooden windows before you replace them whenever possible on a registered historic uh, site in Halifax. Um, in Lunenburg, it's um, not as strict, but it seems to be uh, in keeping with the tradition. So you have these owners, homeowners that really do appreciate um, the tradition of their home. Okay, let's see here. Um, and so I've been fortunate to find some of these, you know, people here appreciate the integrity of the character and the warmth of a, you know, wooden window. It really does contribute to the heritage value. Um, and this most recent project here is uh, in Chester, seven Frida's Point extension. It's right down on the water. And you see the, on the top floor, those three sets of windows, but we replaced all the Southwest facing windows on the water side. Of course, facing the water, they're gonna get a lot of weather and uh, damage um, out there close to the coast. Uh, so we did, uh, 36 windows total from around the back and side there. Let's see here. And this is this painted lady, we call it, at 75 uh, Dufferin Street. It's a registered heritage property here in Lunenburg, and it's really a standout on your way down into uh, Lunenburg. It's on the main drag. If you have the opportunity to come by, you can't miss it, obviously. <laughs> and the detail is, is really magnificent. It's got a five color scheme. Um, this house was, the plans for the restoration started about 10 years ago and we just finished uh, this past winter. Um, so that one was a real joy to work on. The job for me uh, was 50 windows total, so that's 100 sash and the 50 accompanying storm windows that went on top. Wow. It was a <laughs> yeah. full, full restoration, um, <clears throat> and that was my first first project. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Let's yeah. see here. So just getting into uh, the process, this is a sample here on the left of uh, starting to strip down one of the storm windows. And if you look closely, you can see a little storm pin, I guess it's called. It's got a number 14 marked on it now. How they would arrange that would be uh, the same pin would be on the window that it goes on to somewhere. So when they come off and they go back on and you're able to fit them back. Wow. And that's really neat. So we, you discover lots of little things like that. Uh, we just made a map <laughs> because those the, those markers are all long gone. So we made mm. a map for the homeowner mm. and labeled them for them. Uh, let's see here. Are those dentist tools? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it looked like it. <laughs> yeah, they certainly are. Um, so it's the first the first step in the process is to, of course, strip and sand. And these are to some of the tools required, um, you're gonna find build up upon build up of adhesives over the years and patch jobs and, uh, you know, glue. <laughs> um, so, and getting in around, if you can see on the right, there's a, it's a very Buddy. dull profile. Right, it's, and the profile is almost worn away, but those dental tools come in handy um, getting in the OGs and those uh, really intricate profilings. Let's see here. And the first step is to try to get the glass out. You want to get remove all the putty and pop that glass out, hopefully without breaking it. Um, that happens. <laughs> it's uh, stressful, but you want to keep, you know, hopefully your goal is to put that same glass back in. Um, oh. So you pop it out gently and you can use uh, like a heat gun on that. Um, uh -huh. You know, to apply a little bit of heat will loosen up stubborn putty. Um, mm. But it's mostly like controlled force because heat obviously on glass <laughs> is a, it's yeah. risky, <laughs> you know. Uh, let me see here. Where are we going? 
And the, once they're all stripped, you're going to have them, you're going to sand them right back down to the original wood. Wow. And here's where you're going to discover yeah. all the issues and repairs. And pretty consistently, every window would have one bad joint. Hmm. Um, uh, some, maybe not. Again, depending on the location on the house, uh, southwest facing, uh, on the ocean, close to the coast, is really a lot of variables. And even within one window, if one side of the window gets more sun, it's really interesting to see what can happen over 100 to 150 years of wear and tear. All right. So we have it here. We sand it down to the original wood. And you're going to set that glass aside. And let's see here. This oh. is another uh, reveal. You can see a <laughs> tiny remaining bit of a tenon there mm. um but we somebody used a screw to you know just again it's a quick patch job and that's a rusted old screw which we took out of there um we use no fasteners uh used in a wooden window so it's mm. all uh mortise and tenon uh and combination epoxy on repair work uh mm. so commonly picking out bolts <laughs> screws uh, yeah. lots of bugs nails and nails yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah um and old forged nails as well and yeah. from from wherever for whatever purpose mm. so the repair process like i said it can be somewhat extensive if you're missing a tenon we build a new one and this one here you can see would just attach sort of Dutchman style consolidate with the existing rail and mm. or style and that would not hollowed out mortise which would be filled to sort of receive the new the new tenon with putty uh we would use epoxy okay yeah it mm. would be an epoxy filler for that okay and let me see if i can and here's another example now this would be a storm window cross rail where we had to recreate the cross rail which was about uh 18 inches long and it was the old piece was there was only about 12 inches of it left <laughs> so <laughs> we, uh, we needed another cross rail to hold that glass mm -hmm. in place there so it's another sort of interesting part of the job where it's not just fixing up the old stuff but uh recreating it in, in a new way um to look like how they did the old way, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, how, how do you build that profile? So this one would be copied uh, thickness and width, depth, uh, just on a rotor table. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's how you create that. And, you know, I don't know how they did it. So it's not going to be exact, but it's, uh, yeah. they're pretty darn close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. We got another sample here, very similar cross rail combined with the old hollowed out mortise, which is filled with epoxy. Mm -hmm. now, that red tape there, you can see that's just a red tape around a shim uh, to sort of provide a little epoxy dam there on the rabbit. Right. <laughs> yeah. And. So once we get that, and here when I'm talking about the epoxy system, this one is the actually the only one I've used. I know there's like DAP has a all-in-one product and Bondo, and there's so many. Uh, this one's really great. the The liquid is a consolidant that you can apply to, you know, old wood to harden and strengthen it, so it's able to hold a new joint. Um, and then added to the consolidant is a filler, um, and that gives you that nice thick peanut buttery epoxy that fills any hole, and it's moldable as well too. If you have to mock up any profile, it's very easily moldable and sandable. Uh, so that's a really excellent product, and mm -hmm. again, that's used to support any Dutchman joints, any joins, and in attaching our mortise and tenons as well. What kind of a, what kind of equipment do you for your safety do you uh, use when you're dealing with uh, wear system epoxy? Because I 
found it one of the most difficult, um, very, very difficult one for breathing it. And if getting it on your skin can be very difficult. Yes. Well, we're encouraged to use a mask for respiration. We were, I was working mostly outside, which always helps. Um, I did actually all the epoxy work outside. Uh, gloves. What definitely. time of year was that? It was, it would have been summer. Oh, yeah. yeah. So and, it, and into the fall. And is this a quick epoxy, uh, Sarah, or is it, uh, uh, how long does it take to set up? It is, uh, it depends. There's, you can get a quick hardener and a slow hardener and then varying grades of uh, filler that um, it's, a, it's actually like a marine grade epoxy, which okay. works, yeah. it works well on wood. Right. Um, so depending on the finish, that's the type of filler you use. Usually once I mix up like a one batch or one pot of uh, epoxy, I have about 15 minutes before right. I can't use it anymore. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty quick then. Yeah. 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 So you kind of want to have your projects laid out to know where it's going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the repairs here, here's a sample of a Dutchman there and the rabbit the the glass will eventually sit on. That's going to nice. stand it down. And on the right, uh, that's actually a, a Dutchman join on a meeting rail, an upper sash. And you can see the epoxy fill yeah. that's been sanded down. And once that's primed, it's completely seamless. Ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Wait, no, that's not it the glazing process which is actually the quickest uh once you get going at it once you kind of get your groove the stripping sanding repairing dry times waiting that's the longest it takes me about one to two hours to strip one window uh right down to its wood um but the glazing is the is my favorite part um so you have your primed window sash um along the rabbit you're going to apply, um, you can use this putty, but you can also use just a cheaper putty because it's more just of like a bedding putty and it's not going to be exposed. So we would line the rabbit, Yeah, yeah. place the glass on top and fit it in. That bedding putty is going to seal that glass in onto the rabbit and all along the sides. Hmm. Uh, and then you want to insert glazing points. Do you guys know what I mean? Those little, yeah. they look like little W's. Yeah. It's like three bucks for a box of a hundred. Um, and those get inserted between the glass and, uh, the styles and rails, uh, just with a putty knife very easily. You can use a, a glazing, like a point pusher. I've heard of a tool, for like a mm -hmm. point pusher, but it's really quite, it's really quite easy to just sort of gently tap that in there and they go in uh, about every eight inches or so. Okay. Yeah. And then the glazing goes on top and that's, you work that in with your thumb. You really want to make sure that uh, the glass and the edges are completely puttied in. So you just smush it very messily all along the side. <laughs> and uh, so it's, you know, it's just gushing out. And then you want to take a nice flexible putty knife to pull your putty into a clean line. And it's a sample of my glazing there. You can see on the bottom underside, which is the the messy bedding putty, which never gets yeah. seen, it gets cleaned yeah. off. Yeah. And this, this is the nice um, glazed edge, which will get painted and seen from the outside, of course. Yeah, beautiful is technique there. The same, is this the same as the old fashioned putty that people use? It's here? most it? similar. It is, uh, it's not a hundred percent natural. Um, I've used, um, I've used all natural linseed putty and I found it not, it's excellent product. It's not easy to work with. Mm -hmm. um, there, you have to melt shellac and uh, there's a, yeah, it's, it's, it, you have to, it, you mix it. So there's a consistency issue and this is all in one. It's very flexible. It's a half, sort of halfway between natural and synthetic. And, and this, what's your working time? What's your working time with this multi-glaze? In meaning? 
Like, uh, how long would you have be, to be able to cut it and form it and clean it oh, up? Oh, this, this is a, about a three-week drying time. Right, okay, thought so. Yes, yeah. yeah. The other, like, if it, like a DAP window glazing product is right. going to dry faster. Um, again, it's all depending on your product. Um, this is and then the do you get that, much shrinkage or movement of it? No, it actually is made to stay... Yeah flexible a little bit uh, and move with the window, I guess. Um, so, you know, wind resistance, um, it never har it never fully hardens. I mean, it hardens, but it doesn't fully yeah. harden yeah. like rough. Right. Um, but it is a quite a long drying time. So usually on a, <laughs> you know, on a large scale project like Dufferin Street with 50 windows, you sort of have to work <laughs> backwards. So yeah. they're not with, they're not without windows in November, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, cool. yeah. So and there you have that um, glazing okay, again. I mean, COVID be damned. I would love to show you guys. You know, it's kind of hard to explain it just with pictures. I'd love to do a demonstration um, mm -hmm. to get a better idea. But well, you can I come back anytime. Do that. I hope for this. Us, yeah. <laughs> I hope this is okay. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> um let's see what else we have here and this is a result Beautiful. on the inside and this is the chest this is a view out to uh or chester out in the basin um these windows went went in in april That's a terrible and, view yes it's awful um <laughs> one of the things i was going to point out with this process and the results you may notice if the picture on the left on the right with the munchens uh, you can see the outside of the window is black. The inside of the window is white. So it's very fine line with painting to cover the putty, but yeah. not see the black on the inside. <laughs> black and white windows are very unforgiving and there's no straight lines on a wooden window at nope, all. That's for sure. So you, we do the best we can. Um, but you can see there a little bit, my paint kind of creeped out. Uh, but that's okay. They look a lot better than they did. I trust me on that. And here, <laughs> just finishing up here. This is just me bragging about all the work I did last summer. Uh, that's um, pretty awesome. This is a. Uh, I think this is two projects in one at various stages. As you can see, they're just in the stickering and drying phase uh, before they get painted, and they've dried completely. Before they get painted, we usually prep them for their top coat of paint, which can be oil-based or latex, uh, which requires washing all that dried putty. Uh, mm -hmm. You're getting your razor blade out, Windex, vinegar and water. And we also do a nice prep uh, sand. So that primer, which is oil-based and quite thick, we used to take a nice like 200 or 220 grit sandpaper on all surfaces uh, to prep it for a nice clean finished top coat. And of course that gets all washed down and they're, and they get painted. And once that's dry, usually I can do two coats in a day and probably 10, 10 windows, two coats a day, and then flip them and do them the next day. <laughs> yeah. So, and now I'm currently actually building, I'm working on new windows. Uh, our, my employers purchased an old historic barn and we're, restoring it and the the old windows don't exist so we're building new ones to to and we put in uh, we did our put the windows in where we wanted them this time so uh, we're making new windows so I think I've taken apart enough and putting them back together to sort of know what I'm doing with the new ones um, but once they're all put together and primed it'll be another another batch of glazing cool yeah It'll be your so first uh, yeah. the windows then, will it? Sorry? It'll be your first chance at building new, uh, like, windows from scratch then. Yes. I, we learned how to do them in my course, um, hmm. but it was, uh, we built some small windows for the, um, we did sheds, cedar, sh cedar sing single sheds, and we built wooden windows for that. So I had a introduction to it, but, um, yeah, I'm seeing it from start to finish here now. Must be looking forward to that. I think. Ah, yeah, I am. Yeah, very much so. No lead paint involved. So. <laughs> that must be a relief, eh? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> the mask that you have to wear when you're dealing with that kind of stuff. Yes, absolutely. 
That's some really exciting stuff there, Sarah. I, I imagine that our members probably have a number of questions and we've certainly got a few minutes for that. Uh, is it okay to turn it over to questions right now? Sure, yeah. What questions have you, have you got, gang? Uh, Stephen's got his hand up first. Of course I have my hand up first. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. That is just an amazing, um, uh, amazing little tour through some of your work that's that's been, that you've been working on. And um, you know, I'm I'm about to retire. I honestly feel like I'd like to go and do that heritage carpentry program myself. You know, because I got time now. You know, right, right. right. You, you think you do? <laughs> you think you do? Knock it off, David. Come on. <laughs> Uh, but Sarah, uh, I will ask you this, and this is a little bit greedy from a, from an, a current NSCC employee, I guess, and somebody responsible for it. What did you find useful from your heritage carpentry program uh, that was really valuable to what you're doing now? And, and maybe conversely, uh, what did you find not particularly valuable in terms of that, that program? What, what would you have liked to spend a lot more time on? Is that fair question to ask that's yeah that's uh more than fair i would say the the program itself i think is more geared towards i mean i did learn framing i learned roofing um i would have liked to have seen more practical heritage training uh, but we did receive a lot from the communications aspect of the course where we learned about the standards and guidelines of historic properties in Canada um, and historic significance. And I think with the Heritage Carpentry program, it's what you want to get out of it um, is, is what you get out of it. You know, it's, I was there kind of specifically to learn what interested me the most. And um, so and as I came away, um, you know, with, with the knowledge that um, I know I have the appreciation for the heritage. I don't want to get into new building, new materials. And so I think uh, that part of the curriculum, the communications, the research um, was really what I took the most out of. Um, I think in a classroom learning like that, when you have 14, or so students, it's really hard mm. to get the most out of the practical shop sure. time, yeah. um, uh, unfortunately, but it's not to say that I didn't get what I needed, I, you know, from that. Yeah. 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 Just for folks who don't know the program, by the way, you, you, you take the, the Heritage uh, Carpentry program is a two year program. And on the first year, you take the fundamental uh, carpentry that everybody takes in the certificate program. And then the second year is more of a specialized on the heritage side of things. Um, Sarah, they used to be uh, even a boat building <laughs> segment. That's in there. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know if you took that particular portion, but, you know, we're, we're always interested, uh, always kind of getting a sense of, you know, um, I, I will tell you this, that the, that the college right now is looking at a more of a woodworking, fine woodworking uh, aspect and perhaps something like artisanal uh, woodworking as a program somewhere down the road. So I, I will leave this for now, let other folks ask you some questions and maybe ask you some questions about that later on. Thank I you. Will, I will also add, we had a, um, a practical job with uh, NSCC through NSCC, like you said, in my second year, which is a little bit more immersive. Uh, I agree, like you said, and we were on, we were on site at a, a heritage property in Lunenburg uh, Tannery Road. It was an old uh, schoolhouse, and we did redo the the, the front facade. That did include um, the windows, which was my first introduction to it. Um, and unfortunately, with that project, COVID ended our year a little bit short, so we had to board up the windows and not finish them. Um, but that. being being on site, and you know the demo and the, sh the shingling, and you know once you do those cedar shingles and you see how it's done um the corner boards and the trim and how all that works on a historic home those same principles apply so you know once I started working I could recognize those things that I was able to have my hands on in a learning sort of capacity great thanks Sarah sure Bill uh, Bill House has a question next 
Um, Sarah, when when you took that course or, or since it did did they actually teach you how the original tradesmen made those windows? No. And no. Uh, which which uh, well then I'd, I'd recommend to you two things. Uh, one, there's a, an old tool collectors club uh, in Nova Scotia, and uh, for example, there's a specific plane for making a sash. It cuts mm -hmm. a rabbit on one side. It cuts the molding on the other. It's got two blades that, that oh, wow. run down. Um, I, I ran into it. Uh, I was up in Kingston, and, and that place is uh, known for their collection of old tools. Uh, yes. And I went in, and they had a display. Um, and actually, an entrepreneur there had somehow uh, worked out a, a contract with the government that he would take the prisoners from... Uh, uh, the jail and make them his uh, window makers and, uh, oh. and so it, it now the wood that you're working with you will never see again it's not free it's uh, straight grained and you mm -hmm. could use hand tools like that um, I, I have the sash planes and uh, at one time I had the mortiser it's just a, uh, a chisel you put your foot on a lever and the chisel came oh, down wow. And, and took it all out. Uh, I gave that to the museum up in Muscadabit. But uh, I think, like anything, if you see how a tradesman made things, and now that you've taken them apart, you can build them. And mm -hmm. it's it's too bad they didn't show you that in the course uh, in some ways. That uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's like getting out the parts manual when you're trying to repair a tool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Neat stuff, eh? Yeah, very. Yeah. You can learn a lot from taking apart old furniture and oh, absolutely, and and, and, and windows and uh, and and the buildings themselves too. Yes, yeah. uh, you, were, you gotta remember they were all built with a, a hammer and a saw. That's right. And it's interesting, it's interesting to see in a lot of the old homes, especially in the attics and the beams and the the old saw marks and the marriage marks of joints, and it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I saw you coping one of the joints. Uh, that's mm. an old. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> and a nice presentation. Thank you. Um, Kel Kellum had a question as well, and then Don is next. Uh, thank you, Sarah. That was very interesting. As the uh, former owner of an old wooden sailboat, I'm very familiar with West system epoxy and trying to use it to restore wood. Um, but I was wondering if you have any. Uh, criteria or guidelines that you use uh, to determine uh, at what point you make the decision that you know this particular joint or this particular piece is too far gone there's nothing I can do to save this I have to make a new piece for this and if there's any you know things that you consider in trying to save well you place. want to I mean the the structural integrity I suppose and the working parts if there's if there's one joint that I can fix, I'll fix it. If there's two joints on one side, then, then I'll probably recreate a brand new style um, because you really want um, the old and new to be strong together. So, and it has happened where we will just take, I mean, I have a, one window which you could cut a diagonal and one side of it's old and one side of it's new. Um, I think wherever possible, we'll fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless, but I mean, you see a lot of rot. Um, that's another thing. Um, epoxy consolidant doesn't work miracles. So um, it is It is a bit of a triage sort of um, part of the process and a judgment call, but usually if there's any more, if there's damage in more than one area, um, then I would probably recreate that section. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, Don, you had a question as well. Yeah, hi. Uh, again, Sarah, thank you for your presentation. That's great. Uh, it's a lot to learn. Uh, my question is, um, I know you're working with uh, single pane windows mostly, and then of course storm windows. I'm wondering what steps you may be taking to improve e efficiency. 
in terms of you know your air infiltration or just heat retention for mm -hmm. homes or, and are you stuck with any codes that you need to upgrade or uh well we're not when we're doing a restoration on old windows we don't have to worry about code because they didn't exist back then mm -hmm. um so we can stick with the old standards um but let me see sorry can you repeat your question again well it's just more I, i'm interested if if your thoughts as you're doing the restoration are guided oh, right. all yeah. by you know like trying to increase efficiency yeah so i there's varying opinions i suppose on our value uh when it comes to windows um i'm told you know, if you have a single pane vinyl window and a single pane wooden window that's been properly <sighs> restored, or if it's new, that has essentially the same R value. Um, and so it's all in the installation. I have new vinyl windows in my place and they're not installed as properly as, as I've done with some of mine. Um, there is something that wouldn't be original is a weather stripping that we use along the sides and the lower, on um, the lower sash, on the chamfered edge where it meets the sill. Uh, mm -hmm. So we can apply weather stripping in there and along the sides of the lower sash. Um, so when that's going up and down, there's that seal. The storm window, which not all homes have maintained their storm windows, um, but even with a newer aluminum over the wooden, uh, is going to help that as well, of course, in the colder months. Um, so again, I don't have a definitive, you know, our value. Um, I think when I talk about, you know, these picky homeowners with appreciation for that's what they have. They want the, they want the wooden window for the heritage value, which trumps any um, benefit they could get from a newer window. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I think that's all the time that we have. Um, but I really wanted to echo everyone else's uh, uh, thanks and comments there. I'm really thrilled to, of course, uh, see you again, but also to have you here showing off your, your skills and experience. It was really quite a wonderful um, presentation and some things that we don't commonly see as well. So really quite a, I realize you got quite a niche market there and I'm really, um, a little bit envious of the really cool projects that you get to, to do um, in spite of having to work around lead paint all the time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to say again, thanks a lot for, for joining us and sharing us with your expertise. I've got a small thank you that I'm going to send off in the mail uh, one of these days, uh, hopefully tomorrow, and uh, whatever can of post and get that to you. But uh, yeah. please, personal thanks means a lot as well. No worries. I want to thank you all very much. Uh, it was a really a pleasure putting this together. Like I said, I would love to have a demonstration. Maybe we can do that sometime in the future. Um, instead of me just sort of blabbing about it and remembering the steps, it's always easy to demonstrate. But uh, I really appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah. Well, again, thanks. And uh, yeah, that would be a nice uh, future thought there to have a proper uh, demonstration um, uh, at a certain time or even a road trip down to some of the projects that you've recently worked on. Certainly, and my family is in Dartmouth, so I'm in and out of the city all the time.